Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on Knowledge is Health, the intersection between health information and health literacy. My name is Angela Lee. I'm the Health Sciences Librarian at Pacific University, Oregon, with a background in social work. We're here to guide you through the basics of providing health information and applying the principles of health literacy. My interest in this topic is to integrate health literacy into health information services. Oh, don't forget about me. <laughs> Hi, I am Karen Flaherty. I am the Interprofessional Education Outreach Coordinator at Pacific University. Um, and Angela and I are both primarily located at the Health Professions Campus in Hillsboro, Oregon, which is just west of Portland. Um, so I have a doctorate in occupational therapy. Um, my interest in health literacy comes both from personal and professional experiences, as long as, along with my work in my capstone, where I further recognize the need for health literacy services, and it's really become a passion area of mine. Um, I do want to mention that this is a condensed form of a four-hour workshop that we were building, so we do acknowledge it's a little bit information dense, but um, I think most people know through these webinars, they will be, the, the um, slides and resources Sources will be made available to you afterwards. So <laughs> remember that as we go through this. Excuse me, I'm jumping a slide. Hi. Our learning objectives today, at least what we will be covering, is um, how to become more knowledgeable about health information sources, um, provide health related reference service, teach consumers how to find and select good information. Oh. Finally, to recognize the issues of low health literacy in your community. Oh. Um, so we've all seen these kinds of headlines in the news before. How much is truth and how much is sensationalism? Can you really eat a big breakfast and lose weight? And can, can honey be the cure for the cough? Well, according to the National Health Services of, in the UK, honey might be true, but not the big breakfast. So according to the Pew Research Center, did you know health information is a popular research topic? Of course, eight out of 10 online health queries started at a search engine. 59% uh, of US adults have been looking for health information online, and I'm sure that they've been doing a lot more of it lately. Uh, less than a quarter of searchers check the date or verify the credibility of the source. Half of the searches are also on behalf of someone else. And as you know, women and um, minorities also have different ways of looking for information and different purposes. Um, so what is health information? Well here, health information is defined or is specifically referring to health and medical knowledge. That is the disease and diagnosis and treatment. Um, we're not talking about medical records or health insurance or patient education. Health information, as I've used it here, is really referring to the librarian's role in providing health information services to consumers or the public. However, there are a number of related or overlapping terms that make the wording somewhat confusing. Sometimes we call what we do as librarians as health information literacy or health information services or health reference services. We could also use the term health information seeking, but that would apply to all users, all patrons seeking health information. So why should libraries care about health or community health at that? If health is a major concern for all communities and libraries consider themselves to be community centers, then focusing on health is a core issue. So why should libraries help? Well, for one, they are universally supported. They're essential to community well-being. The, the library system support 95% of the population, including promoting child and adult literacy and we're sources of consumer health information. So how are we partners in health? Well, we provide access to update health information. Um, we're a safe environment to get, conduct health information searches, and they can offer, we can offer health-related programming and outreach. And I hope we are a model for workplace wellness. So where should libraries begin? Well, the first you need to do in terms of helping your community is to, to set up a need, community needs assessment. This assessment will tell you about the diversity or lack of in your community, highlight its strengths and weaknesses, 
and give you clues to their needs and problems. In so doing, you may be to discover some inequities which are often described as social determinants of health. This is a belief that socioeconomic conditions of a community has an impact on people's health. So you would start off with a needs assessment by analyzing the demographic profile of the community with its age, education, ethnicity, income, language. Get to know your local health community providers and then assess your potential for developing new programs and services. So how can we as librarians help? Well, continue to do what we as librarians already do well, but add one extra layer of assistance on top of that which I will describe as health literacy assessment. Librarians are not only trained to be the bridge between information and resources, but also a tangible source of support for individuals in their search, search process of research and discovery. Using the same term I defined earlier, health information literacy, librarians are really good at recognizing users with health information needs. We can identify or find the best sources for them to use, we can evaluate the sources um, and give them some ideas about where to search. We can also have um, refer people to onto other sources. What's different here is that this is a health need, oftentimes a much more personal issue for the, for the library user, library patron. We have an opportunity to meet people where they are in the moment and to be more supportive by providing empathy and validation for their health concern. One author I describe, has described it as compassionate reference work, um, a term that is not often used in librarianship. In being a compassionate librarian, we're able to help identify their need, communicate our understanding, that's our empathy and validation, recognize where they may be coming from, and that which is referring to their level of not health knowledge and how we can move along and help them in their, in their information research process. Here's where health information literacy and health um, literacy overlap. So thank you, Angela. Um, that's really powerful. Another thing I'd like to mention uh, related to what Angela was speaking about is a couple weeks ago here on the, um, the Slim Webinar series, uh, Bryce Kozla did a trauma-informed care presentation uh, looking at so looking at that as an additional resource for understanding the compassionate avenue in which uh, librarians can be part of their own and other support resources is, is a good webinar to listen to. Uh, so we wanted to shout out that presentation because it spoke to us as well as compassion and validation are an important component surrounding health topics and information. So let's move on to health literacy um, and then we'll explore what that all means a little further in relating to health information searching. Health literacy as a definition is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services. Oh, the webinar, um, yes, I'm sorry, I'll get back to it. It's called Trauma-Informed Care, um, and it was uh, Bryce Kozla, I believe. Um, so sorry, I interrupted myself in the definition. Um, the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, communicate, process and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. What that's talking about is an individual skill set or ability to find, understand, evaluate. So looking at information and saying, is this a trustworthy place? Is it even information that's relevant to me? And then communicate that information with people involved in their health. So their doctors, families, and then actually start act and use that information. So it's really a lot of responsibility put directly on a user to find and filter through information to then determine if it's even appropriate for them and if it's what is providing them the correct information. So if we're only really looking at the individual's capacity to do those skills, there's often not a lot of progress that can be made for health decisions. And honestly, the confusion level gets higher because health information can and is so complex. So if the people that also interface with health materials, organizations, practitioners, evaluators, and librarians can help to improve, navigate, guide, and engage users with better information, we have the potential to improve health literacy skills and develop health literacy skills in the community. So that brings us to the idea that health literacy is then more 
than just an individual responsibility and has truly been labeled as an emerging public health issue and it is a systemic issue. And furthermore, it really should be said that it's a social justice concern. So anyone who provides health information to others really does need some health literacy skills. They need to be exposed to health literacy tools so that they can use it for themselves and with others. Librarians are very much um, in an important and key role in helping advocate for and moving forward health literacy with their users then, which is something we'll talk more about as we move through this presentation. So <clears throat> now before we get too much further into the hows of that, let's talk briefly about um, health literacy and why it's so critical. So health literacy is a multi-dimensional issue that encompasses many forms and contexts. That's why um, it's an area of concern and need, but it's also an area of great opportunity because there's a lot of contexts that we can work within to make improvements. From the most basic, health literacy is seen in print and oral literacy, which is a lot of what we're typically used to interfacing with when we're talking about health information, I think. These are, you know, avenues like talking and having conversations with our doctors and our family members of reading materials that have been handed to us or have been printed out or we're finding through different resources as we're searching online. Um, but health literacy also encompasses things like numeracy, so items like reading medication labels, nutrition labels, making choices and decisions related to health insurance. So you can see how it can go from what we may view as something relatively simplistic to very complex information and processes that even highly educated people can sometimes struggle with because there's so many components to find and know. And health literacy also does encompass digital and media literacy. So all the technology that we use to find and communicate information. And there's a cultural and linguistic com competency piece. So those are things like beliefs, values, attitudes, traditions, and languages that all influence how we respond to information and particularly how we respond to health information within our own families and communities. So as I've talked about, health literacy is critical and part of that is because the data shows us that there is a great need. We know that low literacy, not just low health literacy, but low literacy is a concern in this country and that automatically influences health literacy because the materials that are being created and presented, people often can just not read or cannot read well. But the item I wanna po point out most on this slide and the data and statistics that we know and that I hope people remember the most is that nearly nine out of adults may struggle in this country to understand and use health information at some point. And that means pretty much everyone is affected at some point in one form or another, either personally or with a loved one, during their life by low health literacy. So who does it affect? I, I know I already said this, but we're at least nine in 10 people. But what we also know from research is that low health literacy is found across all demographic groups, which makes sense. With but we also know that over 90 million adult Americans have true low health literacy. So very simplistic skills within those multidimensional contexts I talked about can create a struggle. And that it, within at least the approximately 30% of that population, there is some disproportionate representation related to disparities and social determinants of health, which is something Angela mentioned earlier, and we will continue to bring up as we go. Another thing we know is that these are often groups of people that we know public libraries serve. So there's a lot of opportunity to reach people most at risk and at need for this health information and health literacy services. And finally, I don't wanna press on the negatives of low health literacy too much here, but a large component of why health literacy is a public health issue is that low health literacy is expensive to everyone, and I don't mean it just from a fiscal perspective, but from a cost of life. Um, I actually think that's something that we're really seeing more openly right now. Many of the people that are disproportionately affected from the coronavirus pandemic that we're experiencing at this time are people that are often affected by low health literacy and have a likelihood of higher mortality rates, such as the senior population, or they come from lower socioeconomic communities. We are seeing inequities highlighted more than ever 
and health literacy affects and is affected by these circumstances. So it's a whole area we can discuss in itself, but let's transition. Angela, next slide, please. So we've talked about the overarching idea of health literacy. We've talked about cost prevalence, that it's a multi-dimensional issue, has varying impacts, and cover that low literacy itself is a concern. But let's shift and talk about seeking out and understanding health information while adding in a layer of health literacy tools and skills. So the first thing I need to personally highlight is that for the average user, information is often hard to compile, understand, process, and then do something with. Because not all of us are versed at researching information at length. And health information and health information searching adds another layer on top of that, another barrier. So these are concerns, so there are concerns to understanding health information. They're from a literacy level to a general health understanding, but then also adding emotions of stress and anxiety. When people are given a diagnosis or someone in their family is given a diagnosis that they're unfamiliar with, or even if they're familiar with it, stress and anxiety increase. We likely have all been there in some form or another. We know that impedes how we search for information and especially how we process and understand it. The other part to think about as a barrier in searching for health information is that nearly 10% of the US population does not even have reliable access to internet. A lot of health information is found on the internet. And health literacy in this e-health era is more complex than ever because of access, general computer use, search engines, and search interfaces can be overwhelming and confusing. And even if they're not, sometimes it's still just getting to the, where do I even start on here? Is Google really the best place? One of the answers to that question then often starts at the library and with librarians. So here I can make the statement that libraries can be key partners in health, health literacy. And the way to go about that is to develop a good health information service. That means becoming much more knowledgeable about health information services and providing appropriate health related reference service. Um, the other thing we can do is, of, of course, is to advocate for consumers' health and literacy. Um, recognize that there are issues of low health literacy in your community and teach users how to find and select good information. We should also take a page from the health professionals about how to interact with our users, patrons, or patients. It's a notion of universal precautions. Thank you, Angela. So yes, in healthcare, um, and I think now everyone's probably more familiar with this term, uh, PPE, but personal protective equipment is something that is a known practice and safeguard um, that we utilize because you can't always tell by looking at somebody that they're affected. And I don't mean just from the coronavirus, uh, but, from, but for other things. Listen, we've, we've done this way before coronavirus, we'll do this way after, but it's something that's very practical to take from medical practice and say, we don't always know, and so here are some things we can do to protect ourselves, but also protect others when we're engaging in interaction, interaction with them, and as part of how you can provide compassionate service. So we take this notion into searching for information and health information that you can't always tell by looking at someone that they have low literacy or low health literacy. Also understanding and remembering that everyone benefits and appreciates clear communication regardless of the topic. One other thing that's important to mention is that having higher literacy and higher health literacy does not always equate to having higher understanding, especially when those emotions like stress and anxiety are involved. So by practicing under this idea of using universal precautions, working with people surrounding information and health information, you can create a safe and shame-free environment for information gathering. Users can feel and find more support to seek out answers or at least information related to their health questions, which provides more thoughtful health interactions and empowerment for personal health decisions that can be made with their families and medical providers. All right, so you've heard this question before. Can you tell me how to find information on? And what do you think when you hear these terms in the media? Well, before we start answering this question, we have to a little bit more about why and how we provide health reference. 
It's different from your typical reference work, which is a very intellectual process, but many times we don't know how information is being used afterwards. In health reference, the stakes are higher. The findings may be put to use for medical decision-making by a patron or patient. We can, use, we can actually see anxiety and fear that comes out with a medical diagnosis or prognosis. And the emotional aspects of a patient's illness makes this work difficult. We call into, into this a deeper understanding with, with our patients, what I, what I refer to as compassionate reference work earlier. When consumers ask for help with a medical or health condition, their request is often couched in terms of they need advice, some kind of treatment option, and as well as the fact that they want to share their feelings, their anxiety, their fear, their stress. So some things to consider when you're actually working with users or consumers. One is that they may often not have complete information when they come to you. Information may be needed may be really sensitive information questions like mental illness or sexual dysfunction. Um, health concerns may be serious or life-threatening. Um, they may be concerned about confidentiality and privacy. They may also have unreasonable expectations about um, what information they can find. And they may be confused about what our roles as library staff. And of course, library staff may be concerned that they might be providing the wrong or negative information. So questions you want to ask yourself is, you know, can the question be answered? Did the consumer ask the real question? And did the librarian understand the actual question? And of course, is the information findable or available? One example I can give you is I had a colleague who had wanted to ask, um, wanted to find information on medical side effects of a drug. Um, and I probably should have probed her further, but I gave her the resource that she could go to to use, but I found out later that she was talking about herself and also about um, that she was, have, she, was, she was being diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. And so if I knew that in context, I might have been able to direct her differently and much more effectively. Um, there are some do's and don'ts about health reference that I would recommend one is um, do offer a welcoming safe place for your interviews with them. Um, do establish good communication. Um, be aware of person asking the question. It may not be that person who's having the condition, it may be someone else. Be empathetic, don't judge, don't give opinion, and don't dismiss their issues. Remind users that you're a librarian and not a healthcare provider. And know when to refer to others, particularly health professionals. Um, don't make assumptions about users, um, don't offer personal experiences, and certainly don't assist in self-diagnosis or self-treatment. Um, don't pretend that you have medical knowledge, and um, don't be afraid to tell the person that you don't know. I do that often. Um, on one occasion, I had a patient who wanted to find clinical trials for cancer, um, and when we were trying to do the search, I asked specifically what kind of diagnosis did they have, and the, the patron referred to me that she was looking for a friend. And so, as you know, if you look at clinical trials, it's a heavy duty research um, resource, and specific knowledge of a disease is, is helpful, is very important. And so, here you want to get as complete information as you possibly can. Um, some additional tips that I will um, give you is about communication. Compassionate neutrality is the art of absorbing the full context of what a patron tells you without judgment, criticism, or pity. At this point, um, questions will certainly test your personal comfort zone. And you as a professional might have to be comfortable or at home with the different types of feelings that, that a user expresses. The other, the other um, con issue would be to be much more self-aware, being conscious of your verbal and nonverbal communications. Um, it's essential to maintain some emotional balance and to have your feelings in check um, so that you can actually help the patron so that they are there. Um, you can help the patron address the questions that they're there for and they're, they have a reason for coming to the library for. Um, this is where we look to our professional code of ethics to guide our actions. Um, really try to put your personal feelings and convictions aside, listen to the patron, give them some sense of security, and don't attempt to practice medicine. 
So when you are researching these questions, try as much as possible to get as much information as you can. You know, ask open questions like who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now, it may, some of these questions may sound intrusive, but you can, just, you can um, tell them that it really is, helps them, helps you to go ahead and help them find the information that they need and that you will certainly keep their privacy and confidentiality in mind. Um, go ahead and look up unfamiliar terms. I always look at a dictionary, you know, a medical dictionary. I, if I don't know, I, I don't know everything in the world. So, so of course, that helps me to, to, to check things out. Um, be aware of the fact that there's limitations to medical information, medical knowledge, as you, as you know, it's, it's changing day by day. And definitely go ahead and teach as you go, just in order to empower your users so that they can find their own health information in the future. Okay, so um, as we are familiar, sorry, excuse me, I think I skipped this slide. Um, now, since we've covered the reference interview, let's get it back to what our original go goal is, which is to help our users find the information they need. This is where knowing the demographics of your community can help you identify what the key issues are of interest to your users. Librarians should have a basic knowledge of the most useful sources in terms of the health, health topics that their community might be interested in. And librarians should be able to make a quick assessment of some web or print, print content. That's our health literacy quick assessment, which we will describe shortly. First of all, I'm starting off with some of the basic tools that we as librarians all are familiar with. We know how to use the criteria or checklist for evaluating websites. And I often go to the uh, what is it, the resource that says, you know, I call it the ABCs of ABC checklist, which is accuracy, authority, bias, coverage, and currency. There is also in the higher education community, at least where I'm working, that we use something called CRAP test, which is really true. It's actually named as a CRAP test. And you're looking again for authority and accuracy and relevance. Um, the National Library of Medicine has put out a tutorial on how to evaluate internet health information. And um, it's a good tutorial to go through. They emphasize the same thing, which is the quality of the information and the authority of the information. And then of course, I can't escape this discussion without talking about the fact that health information also includes fake news, misinformation, and scams. And so there are many methods for how you evaluate that. I found this one called Fact Checking Coronavirus, which is pretty new and, and interesting. Um, they base it on the SIF method, which is, stands for stop to investigate the source, find better coverage, and then trace the claims. And so aside from my tools, um, there are some health assessment tools that you might add. Thank you, Angela. So yes, if the health reference interview, health website evaluation checklists aren't enough, I do have another one to add. Um, hopefully it makes sense in conjunction with what Angela was talking about in sifting through material to be confident what health information sources you're using are relevant and can be actionable for the consumer to use. So this is to help guide through the evaluation process of answering questions such as, is this written at an accessible level? Are there components of the site I'm looking at or the sites that I am looking at that are best tailored for users? And even just, where do I start? So you can use this idea of performing a quick assessment or a filtering evaluation for, uh, for health literacy standards, building on the skill sets you already have for filtering through resources. Um, Angela has talked about this some and we'll highlight it further. She will actually walk you through some websites, um, but there are specific tools you can, can do quickly to use some of the health literacy strategies. A quick, a quick assessment of health literacy is looking at the basics or the most commonly noted items of what developers of health literacy materials should already be adding or addressing when creating consumer facing materials. So as Angela goes through this, she's going to be looking through these steps. Um, so things she's looking for are the basics. These are things like overall readability, which encompasses plain language. Is there a lot of medical jargon? Are there just a lot of terms, long scientific words? Are there lots of graphs and charts with numbers? All those things that we talked about earlier that make health literacy multidimensional and are components that get confusing within health information quickly. 
and they really can make the entire page just hard to navigate. Another item within this is, the, is if the information is given in simple, concrete ways. So is it easy to navigate, like I said, not just from the platform, but is it separated into pieces or chunks of information? Kind of like this slide, maybe it has bullet points, maybe information is written in short paragraphs instead of long run on sentences and, and paragraphs that are smushed together. Is it easy to read through and find buttons that say things like easy to read materials? Do they even provide these types of usability features? And are there places on the website you can find multiple language translations? And then also remembering things like context, which we've talked about and the importance of. Is it even on topic? Are there specific cultural aspects that need to be considered when filtering through the material? And again, language. All of these things affect how usable the information is for the user. So hopefully some of this quick assessment filter we briefly talked about will be more tangible um, as Angela guides you through some websites. Okay, so let me start off with um, COVID-19 is a perfect example of novel and evolving issue. Information isn't centralized or standardized anywhere. So you must draw upon many, many websites out there like major platforms in social media, Google, Facebook, um, Medline Plus, which is our go-to consumer resource, all refer to um, COVID-19 questions to the CDC, the um, Center for um, uh, Disease Control, and also to the WHO, the World Health Organization. So I'm gonna start off first with the coronavirus issue in the CDC. Basically, you can see this nicely laid out website um, it, it lists symptoms, it talks about how to protect yourself and how, what you do when you're sick. This is, is much more nicely packaged for the consumer to use. Prior to that, they, um, in fact, I was looking at it two months ago, um, they had this huge text page describing what coronavirus is and then all of the things that you needed to do and then what was the recommendations and was text heavy and was difficult to assess and, and, and actually to use. And in, in many ways, it was actually at a very high level of language because I tested the page with almost according to the flesh Kincaid test scale was at 12th grade level. And then things have changed since then because see the CDC recognizes um, that, you know, that there are a lot of users out there who want to check out the information and, and in order for the users or the consumers or the public to understand, they need to scale back what they were writing. Remember now, CDC is an organization that devotes itself to both researchers, scientists, and physicians, and of course the public. And they do have a public interface that they do try to make available to the public to use. But oftentimes in this kind of instance, it's quite, um, it's new, it's novel, and of course there's a lot of things to learn. So they have improved in terms of their, their page. This site is from the World Health Organization. As you see, this is their front page. They, they haven't quite fully designed it um, good enough for the public to see. However, if you were trying to look for your answer, you would look up that blue link that says your question, or the blue box that says your questions answered here. They also have an FAQ design for the public to use, and they try to answer those questions that, that um, the CDC does too. Um, in fact, the latest thing is that they've been putting up some um, um, fact, fact sheets that you can download and there's a lot of illustrations to it. They've tried to make it much more user friendly for the public and um, much more understandable as a whole. And as you know, both of these sites, the intentions or the goals are primarily to serve multiple audiences. One is the very high level research scientists and physicians, and the other one, of course, the public. And so um, both of the sites are very reputable. There is no doubt about it. It's just about how much um, can be understood or what's comprehensible for a public to use. Now, as you know, there are lots of information out there right now and, and a whole host of different sites that you can um, um, and view. And what we've discovered, at least I've discovered recently, was this really neat site that came up from Harvard and, and um, working with other partners called um, COVID-19 Health Literacy Project. And basically, they had the idea and they understood that the public needed some really reliable and valid information that is multiple language that they could use 
that would be understandable to those people who are you know, needing some information, at least some clear guidance. So what you will be doing is to you know, recommend various kinds of sites that are available and particularly with, with the notion that it's, it's understandable for the public to use. Okay, so COVID-19 is of course a very new topic. And so it, it doesn't fit quite the model of websites or um, um, uh, medical information websites that you would use. So we tend to go to our go-to source, which is Medline Plus, and our go-to topic, which is diabetes, because it's a very traditional topic that has been well established in terms of the literature, of the research, and of the um, patient education emphasis. And so on this website, you can see immediately, it's already nicely designed. It has a search box at the top. It has sections for multimedia resources and includes a whole host of language related resources. So here, when you type on the top of the box, it will take you immediately to several links, including this one here, which talks about diabetes and it lays it out in a nice menu with um, uh, what's the diagnosis, what's the treatment, what is the prevention methods, um, what's the genetics, what's the clinical trials, and um, you can click into those different resources to explore more of the information. The other thing it does too is that there are easy to read guides. As you can see down below, um, they have links to multiple languages, in fact, and um, um, that will, will address some of the, the issues about, you know, is, is it available to other, um, other minorities? And then, um, of course, if you wanted to, just below the search box is um, a Spanish language. You can translate the whole website into Spanish language. Of course, um, what you want to do is also look at the multimedia sources that are available. They talk about drugs. They talk about medical tests, lab tests, and also um, they provide tutorials and videos. So. Besides, um, I'm sorry, let me just back up a little bit. I, um, I forgot to mention a couple of things. The reason why we point to Medline Plus is the fact that it has a very close connection to the National Library of Medicine. It's actually its public arm. And as you know, the National Library, Library of Medicine sponsors what is our, our major biomedical database, which is PubMed Medline. And that is where the latest research is gonna come out. And of course, whatever um, happens in PubMed Medline, they try very hard to translate that into Medline Plus, so you will have all of the necessary links that would be helpful in terms of learning more about a disease or illness. Um, the other thing I will mention about Medline Plus is the very fact that when you do a search, it provides a whole host of authoritative links to organizations and websites, so you can do further research. It's a nice starting place. And again, related to that is the fact that I try to emphasize to my um, users um, that there, there's a whole host of, what is it, uh, um, websites designed by, um, by uh, research institutions, by academic institutions, professional associations, and even professional societies. And for example, in this case, American Diabetes Association is a good source to go to because they knew, know that they, there's an audience out there who are trying to address their issues regarding diabetes. Um, they will, of course, highlight both the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention methods. They have pages for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, so they know who their audience are, and they know how to go about getting that information across to them. Again, um, there are several websites out there. Another one by Jocelyn Di um, Diabetes, which is coming out of Harvard. They have a whole diabetes learning center that would be useful for someone looking for more information if they have specific issues that they wanna deal with. These are the sources we go to. So I often emphasize looking at other websites, for, particularly from academic and research centers, from um, social support centers and professional organizations and associations. Finally, I want to mention, um, or at least introduce you to the notion about graphic literacy, specifically graphicmedicine.org site. It's a trend in health and medicine stemming from medical humanities to present health and medical information in, in picture form, like comics, so that it's much more accessible to the public, especially around health issues, both physical and mental. This particular site highlights 
um, various sources of information, various sources like novels, picture books, and manga that provide health information for adults and children about disease, illness, disability, developmental issues, you know, whether it's diabetes, depression, or sex education. The only issue I would raise about this website is that the sources they refer to are not always vetted by the official health authorities, so you should take some care about pointing people to these sources. Use your website evaluation judgment to help people decide what's appropriate. I can say this website is operated by responsible, responsible medical authors and artists according to their mission. And so this would be an interesting and also valuable resource to go to. Um, in another example, something called Lifeology that Karen discovered, um, um, uh, they actually did one on coronavirus. It was coronavirus of comics. Karen, can you say anything more about this one? Uh, yeah, thank you, Angela. So um, I was speaking more to just graphic medicine and, and thoughtful visual representation of information really is an interesting emerging area for health information. And I'll speak directly to that website as well in a minute. But um, I do want to mention that Graphic literacy is something that's already been utilized in healthcare, um, but I think it's having a bigger presence now with all of the multimedia avenues we have. Um, and as people are recognizing the opportunity and needs for providing information to everyone. So we're definitely coming from a more accessible viewpoint um, across the board, which is really exciting. Um, so sites like this Lifeology, uh, Angela mentioned, um, have utilized scientists and professional artists to create visuals that have been thought through in a way that is more accessible. Um, it, we, they are using and creating a space where the information is filtered down to be accessible and the visuals land somewhere in that middle ground between realistic and yet cartoonish. And sometimes that can be more available to a broad audience. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention about this is, um, we have to be a little careful about how we filter information. And so I'm only gonna speak on this briefly because it really talks more to the developmental si development side versus the searching side for materials, but I think it can help give context when you're looking at materials for health literacy purposes. Um, as we filter information really heavily and towards a more visual nature, we can sometimes come to a place where the information can feel juvenile. So, as Angela pointed out, we do have to be careful about judgment and context, not just from that authoritative perspective, but also if that information is even speaking to the demographic or population that you're trying to help search and provide the information for. So it's really interesting if you look at information designed for children or teens, it can actually often be more thoughtfully created with less, I call it noise, within the information, but remembering that it's not also then of just as appropriate to say, well, it's simple. It has all those plain language things that I learned about, um, but there's not all this extra confusing information and the pictures seem to be okay. I can just automatically use that for my adult population. Um, so just being aware of what's appropriate for populations and the people you're serving and, and what's not necessarily um, ultimately okay to just to jump to, um, but but really there's a lot of good things that are coming out within this whole realm of graphic literacy. Um, so hopefully there'll, there'll be more to be seen soon with this. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, so, so let me lead into what does your community need? So that brings us back full circle. What does your target community need? Your needs assessment and any usage data you collect on your website will tell you about their top search interest. And what you can do is try, try to identify some good programming opportunities there, and then definitely invest in your consumer. That means train them in terms of finding information, teach consumers how to navigate the internet and find the best sources. The success of the trainer train, train the trainer programs encourage kind of inter-community dispersal information, basically. If you teach someone in the family they, how to navigate, then they, it will have a trickle effect. Yeah, uh, thank you, Angela. Um, yeah, information overload happens quickly. I kind of put this uh, slide in here just for all of us. Um, I feel like we're all feeling that way, uh, but it's also a concept uh, to remember when we're providing information. Um, 
in really supporting users in guiding from a place of need to know versus nice to know. Um, it's, it's a helpful way to remember that information overload happens quickly. And um, as a reminder to my librarian community that most of us are not versed at researching topics at length. I, I personally uh, have to remind Angela that sometimes. <laughs> so remember um, this one we're providing guidance, sources, and amounts of resources. And then we want to, Angela and I want to point out that as librarians, it's not your job to interpret the information for users and, and you shouldn't, and you shouldn't feel that that's what we're saying here. But what we are saying is it's okay to help guide users to trusted resources, encourage their interest in learning about health information. I really view that you're in a prime role to help people to best engage with the information so they can develop health literacy skills and engage in their health choices with their families and healthcare providers and in their community. In this process, you will become more health literate too. And ultimately that makes for a more health literate community. Okay, so here's our takeaways. We should definitely acknowledge librarians can play a major role in providing health information. We can recognize that low health literacy exists in our communities and we can help address some of those issues. Um, there is um, an intersection that occurs between health information service and health literacy. And for sure, we want to advocate for our consumers and their specific needs. Then. Thank you. Questions? Oh, yeah. So if people have questions yet, yeah, put them in the chat box. And then um, Angela will also put up our resource slide and um, our contact information so that if people want to think about questions and send them to us later, we will get back to you on them. So um, Amy is asking, do you have any advice for tactfully approaching issues with patrons about confirmation bias and proving a negative? We often get questions from patrons that would like only research that supports their predetermined conclusions. Angela? Um, do you, uh, let me let me let me try to answer that question. Um, are you saying that is your question how you address patrons who come in and they're trying to look for information that just validates their own thinking? Is that how I'm interpreting that? She responded yes. Okay. Well, you know you have to kind of go with where the patron or user is going but then also show them that there's alternative sources of information too, and that they should realize that, that that's the whole nature about looking for information. You want to look at all of the possible sources out there so you can determine for yourself what is, what, what is the answer for you or what, what, what you believe to be your, your solution. We can't, we're not in the business of trying to steer them away from whatever their thoughts are, because that's difficult and in and of itself. What we do want to make sure is that we allow them the opportunity to see so many sides of a story. I hope that, I mean, that's, I hope that kind of answers the question, although it's still vague, but still, um, yes, you, you can't, if someone's already pre-thought something, it's difficult to move them away from that, but you can certainly kind of guide them. Thank you, Angela. Um, uh, someone's asking if you can flip back to the resource slide, please. Sure. And then I wanted to point out um, Michelle Spots is on here, who was actually um, part of my capstone process. So hi, Michelle. Um, she is pointing out that the NNLM Reading Club supports uh, library book club discussions on health topics and includes book discussion guides, promotional materials, and author information and it helps promote health literacy within the familiarity of a book club. So thank you for pointing that out, and, uh, Michelle. Um, and she has in included the links in the chat. Um, and I wanted to add a shout out to Michelle. Thank you very much. She did bring up the concept of compassionate librarianship. Um, also on the resource page I wanted to mention is the fact that MLA is um, uh, having an, a webinar next week on graphic medicine if anyone's interested in it. So you can go to the MLA website and try to see if you want to sign up for that. Other questions?
Well, we want to we want to thank you, uh, thank everyone for being being on here. And um, again, it, some of this uh, takes time to absorb, and it, and you may come across the need for this later. So please keep our contact information um, in mind. Um, oh, we, we shouldn't forget that you know, um, Karen and I have come have um, been working together um, for a couple of years now, and basically we want to thank um, the National Library of Medicine because they did provide us with a grant to talk about health information services and also health leaders. So, shout out to them. Yeah, and then um, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, oh, what good. kind of programming have you seen developed in libraries around health literacy? Um, and and then how do you balance your approach to the reference interview when some of your questions may touch on privacy and sensitive medical information? Okay, so um, I, I I can answer both, but I I, I could leave the first one to mm -hmm. Kathy. You want? Or you can start, and I'll you, I'll, I'll you yeah. can start, and I'll jump yeah. in. Oh, okay. So. Um, we have let's just say this the programs that we've been trying to 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 develop um, um is in the public library um arena um in our our neighborhood which is basically um in the hillsborough cornelius um this community um we what we did was to combine the two that means that what what you're trying to do is to create a health program a program of, which is a, a topic of interest like diabetes, or even um, what is, I think the last thing we were concerned was about autism in children or learning disabilities in children. And basically um, what we would try to do is develop a program. It's, it's not to just only focus on health literacy. What would happen is that you're talking about um, the, the, the issue about diabetes, but you're trying to present it in something in a manner that is understandable, comprehensible, and accessible to your, to your community. So in the Cornelius Public Library, that neighborhood is more than 50% Hispanic. And so we recognize that we need to address the, um, the program so that it, it, it speaks to the Hispanic population there, not just to, you know, to, to English speaking people. And so that's why we look at um, a, a health topic and you view that health topic from a health literacy principles in terms of how best to address, how best to get that information across to people, being aware of what their level of knowledge is, as well as what their um, um, ethnicity or heritage is from. Um, and in uh, the second question, well, Karen, do you have anything to add there? Um, yeah, I, I think mostly, Yes, that's about uh, com what the community needs are, and then figuring out how to provide that information in a way that is accessible is how the health literacy piece comes out. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, there's a the National Library of Medicine has a program called Engage for Health that um, is available to libraries and communities and, and provides an, uh, um, a kind of a program in a box that it helps with teaching and educating people of how to have conversations with their with their doctors and so so often um, and their healthcare providers and, and that is one of the other programming um, types of of outreach that we've seen that has worked through the library system. Um, Karen, what was the second question now? Could you remind me? Uh, yeah, sorry. There's a, um, how do you balance your approach to the reference interview when some of your questions may touch on privacy and sensitive medical information? Sure, question. of course. Um, I have to come here with both a librarian as well as a social work perspective. Um, quite often when someone um, tells me that, you know, you know that or confides in me that they have uh, um, a, a matter of concern, private concern, um, I, I have two responses to that. One is that I, I, I definitely let them know that, you know, um, I'm here to help them find information to help them in their decision making, and that I will definitely keep their, um, in, um, what is it, their personal information private and confidential, and I'm not in the business of describe, discussing that further. In fact, all my interactions with all my patrons are, are between the two of us, it's not any for anyone else to know. 
The second thing I would suggest also is the very fact that um, um, we have a code of conduct too, and if you a code of ethics, and basically um, we abide by that by making sure that our patrons, our users, um, know that you know we're there to assist them, and then and that we do also have a um, a, a code of um, um, a, a professional code in which we want to keep that information um, 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 private and confidential. And of course, finally, I would say that as a social worker. Um, my work with um, pa patrons, I, I approach it the same way, is that I let them know that, you know, um, your issues are, are, are um, your own. We are only really there to help you, and we will try to guide you as best as we can. I will add one more thing. I, I, I just it, the thought just came to me is um, you can always if it becomes very tricky. Sometimes it can be very tricky for a patron. They may not want to even tell you that they have an issue, and so you don't have the full picture. And so what you want to do is that suggest if they need some help, refer them back to their health provider, their health professional. And there is a bunch, there's a whole lot of social support services out there that would also help them if they felt that they, they wanted to discuss this in private and you assist them where you can. I hope that helps. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so one of the questions that's coming in is where do you conduct these reference interviews? Um, no, um, our, 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 you know, the library setting, of course, is not the most, what is it, um, private, you know, it's out in the open generally in some, uh, in front of a desk. If, how, what I do is that I make a determination as to how much um, I want to work with the, the, the patient or the user alone. So if it starts to, and, and most of us know, when it starts to get very personal, or very, very, um, um, it's, it's very sensitive, um, you start to move the patron or the user to some other place where you can discuss this. You can in fact tell them, you said, you know, it sounds like, you know, you have some clear issues that you want to discuss, but you don't want to do this out in the public. So do you want us to talk about it elsewhere? So, you know, you, you know, hopefully we find a spot where we can talk in much more, um, um, what, uh, in a room that doesn't have, uh, isn't out in the public. Well, it's about two minutes to two o'clock on oh, to our time, two o'clock. Is there mm -hmm. any other questions out there, or Karen, you have anything else to add? No, I just appreciate people um, showing up and having interest for this. Um, and I do want to thank Kelly for uh, including the link for the Engage for Health program in the chat box. Um, it's another resource in there. Yes, and Slim Tech is reminding us there will be a recording of this webinar. <laughs> thank you all for your time. Yes, thank you all for your time. Do we, do we stick around? <laughs> we can stick around to the very end. There's only two more minutes. If anyone wants to stick around, that's perfectly fine. We'll try to answer your questions. Yes, and please please reach out with questions if if you if they come up over time. All right, it's two o'clock. Mike, how are we doing? <laughs>